Thank you so much, Marcelo, for the invitation to join you this morning. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person. I'm going to summarize a paper which is available for any of you who would like to read it. Just send me an email uh, because I would very much welcome your feedback and your questions and your comments as we finish these papers for publication. And the paper is titled Between Loss and Hope, Paradoxical Educational Effects of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And at the bottom of that slide, is the email address where you can ask me for a copy of the paper if you want to read it. And I'm gonna structure my presentation in four sections. I'm going to uh, quickly provide an overview of the educational effects of the pandemic. I'm going to then talk about the silver linings in education. I'm gonna comment on the risks um, and I'm gonna talk about the opportunities. So the on the educational effects, in, uh, on March 11, when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, uh, my colleague Andrea Schleicher, Director of Education at the OECD and I, sent a survey to ministers of education and other senior education leaders, asking them what plans they had made to continue to educate during the pandemic and what difficulties they foresaw. And that document, which is perhaps now of historical value more than anything is very telling um, because essentially education leaders anticipated what came to be. When we, for example, we asked them how critical are the following priorities in response uh, to the crisis? And they're organized from those that receive the most responses to the least re at the top to those at uh, the least responses. Most people were concerned with ensuring continuity of academic learning, with providing professional support to teachers so that they could teach remotely, ensuring the well-being of teachers, supporting students who did not have the skills to study independently, ensuring their well-being, and so on. We asked the same respondents, um, how challenging is it going to be to address those priorities? And at the top, they said, ensuring continuity of academic learning is gonna be very challenging supporting students who don't have the skills to learn independently, ensuring that parents can support their students, ensure, ensuring that we have ways to assess student learning, redefining curricular priorities during the crisis. We then ask them, uh, have you begun to put in place arrangements and how challenging has it been? And at the top of the challenges was the availability of technological infrastructure, addressing students' emotional health, achieving the right balance between on-screen digital time and screen-free activities. My colleagues in the Global Education Innovation Initiative and I then began a study, which we conducted between June of 2020 and uh, March of 2021, examining the, and it's an open access book, you can download it on that, on that link, which I'm happy to provide. And we examined what had happened to the pandemic in the following countries. And we also had a couple of chapters that looked at cross-national evidence, um, in some cases in OECD countries and another in the developing world. And the story of that study is that the influence of COVID on education, of which only the influence via the closure on schools, really happened through the following channels. Number one, crowding out of fiscal space because governments had other priorities. And for some of them, it became challenging to devote more resources um, for the strategies of continuity the austerity of families, because the distributional effects of the pandemic were very unequal. And now families found it difficult to support their kids. So the reason some children, uh, some girls were married off and began to work wasn't just because they weren't engaged with schools, it's because the families uh, had less money to support them. There was of course a health impact of life loss. There was the interruption of schooling and the inadequate arrangements that had been provided and there were also multiplier effects of the pandemic and other challenges. This is a recent chart put together by UNESCO and the World Bank that talks about how long the school closures lasted. And what we know is they lasted much longer than anyone anticipated in March 18th, and in many countries, far too long. But the story of that book, the story of that book that examines the educational impact of the pandemic, the main story is that it's not really a single story that it's a story that is largely mediated by nationality and by social class, because the responses of governments were very different as well as institutional capacity and 
the protecting factors that children who had parents with more resources uh, made a very big difference in how this pandemic played out. So what are the key mediators? Obviously, policy decisions, both at the national level, but also at subnational levels. In contexts where the federal government was missing in action, as was the case of the United States, Brazil, or Mexico, state levels stepped up to meet that capacity. And in most societies, civil society organizations stepped up in partnership with governments, a point that I'll come back to later. The role of pre-existing conditions made a big difference. Countries like Finland, countries like Singapore had both made investments in providing digital connectivity and in developing the capacities of teachers to teach online and of students to learn online. And of course, they were significantly uh, less affected in the pandemic than countries that hadn't met such investments. The role of intersectoral coordination, particularly between education and health policy, made a very big difference. In some places, it was total disarray. Health authorities were saying one thing, education authorities were doing something else. Coordination across levels of government uh, made a very big difference. Leadership, point I'll come back uh, to later. Partnership with uh, civil society and cross-national cooperation. But even though most of the existing research on the pandemic right now is on education is obsessing on the question of learning loss, on average learning loss, significantly less attention has been given to what is the main conclusion of this book, which is that educational inequality increased during the pandemic, both within nations and across nations. And least developed countries experienced the brunt of six forces that were mutually reinforcing. The longer school closures, the lowest levels of resources and institutional capacity to mitigate learning loss, the lower levels of access to vaccines, the greatest increases in poverty, the lower effectiveness of alternative modalities to education, and the greatest levels of pre-existing social and educational inequality. And so, for example, most countries put in place alternative modalities to educate during the critical period of the pandemic that consisted of both online resources, TV education, radio education, learning packages. But one of the challenges of those multimodal strategies is that they became a stratified system where the children of the poor having access to the least interactive forms of delivery, one way form of delivery. So the pandemic was a, a quintessential, had a quintessential Matthew effect, the term used by Robert Merton based on the um, on this story on, on, on Matthew 25 that basically says the rich will get richer and the poor will lose whatever they had. And this is the story of educational opportunity during the pandemic. But it's very important to balance that story of what was lost, which I have titled in this book, The Educational Calamity of the Pandemic, with the story of the silver linings. What was gained? Because the pandemic presented the once in a lifetime opportunity when the normal rules of operation of the education systems were upended. And in that context, it was possible for people to work in new ways and to produce new things. And a lot of good things happened. So early on, after we had produced that, what well, was the first cross-national study of the impact of the pandemic, which we did with the OECD, we realized that just talking about those findings uh, actually had a very deleterious effect because it was diminishing hope. It was amplifying what everybody knew, that uh, the poor were going to suffer greatly. And so we began to document efforts by national, subnational, civil society organizations, efforts to continue to educate, even in those challenging circumstances. And we produced 45 case studies conducted rapidly, which we have recently integrated into this book. And the story of this book is really quite hopeful. It's really quite hopeful because it talks about organizations that in a very difficult time with very little resources did admirable things. For example, the Fundación Sumate in Chile, an organization run by the Hogar de Cristo of the Society of Jesus that works with children who have been abused by their families and as a result of that left their homes. Most of them are street children. And this organization knew that when the government ordered a period of confinement, if they lost touch with the kids, these children would lose touch with the only adults that they trusted. And they created in record time a program delivered in WhatsApp to both continue 
the education, it's an accelerated learning program to help these kids complete their high school, but it's especially a program of life skills development and emotional development. And that they were able in a matter of weeks to essentially put together a team of psychologists and social workers who were checking in with these kids early in the morning with each and every one of them with WhatsApp was really remarkable. Um, similarly, the, or an, another organization in India that works with very poor children in Mumbai, both teaching them English and life skills, did something very, very similar. Use WhatsApp, which we now know it is the most accessible technology around the world. Everybody has access to WhatsApp even if they don't have internet, or most people do. And a number of organizations managed to create and deliver a curriculum uh, through WhatsApp. There were other examples of innovation. For example, the network Teach for All, which is a network uh, of organizations like Teach for America in 70 countries, where the members of that network are communicated and learn from one another. Teach for Nigeria, when the government shut down the schools, engage their fellows in producing a basic curriculum of English and mathematics uh, on WhatsApp and delivering it on WhatsApp. And when the government of Chile shut down the schools, immediately two 24-year-olds who had read what their peers in Nigeria had done did the same thing. And they produced extremely engaging lessons of math and Spanish, which called the attention of the mayor of this very low-income community and the mayor shared that lesson in a meeting of 200 mayors. And that led to a partnership between 200 municipalities and radio stations and to 50, 20 somethings producing a curriculum that presented a solution which the government had not been able to produce to provide some educational continuity um, in very low income communities. But what is interesting is not just that a group of 50 young people in Chile were able to do that, is that through that network of 70 organizations in 70 countries, that news spread very rapidly. And so the same efforts in Nigeria that had inspired similar efforts in Chile, inspired efforts in Peru and in Colombia and in Mexico. So there is a lot we learn about how it is that good ideas can come from anywhere and that good leadership is about recognizing those ideas and augmenting them something which does not characterize the way in which most public education systems work normally when they're really very much structured in silos and where communication goes within silos and then across silos. In the pandemic, those rules of communication were broken and it was out of necessity that leaders, the best leaders, actually made themselves very vulnerable and invited input from anyone. The Secretary of Education of Bogota, another one of the case studies contained in this book, the very same day that the national government shut down the schools, called a meeting on Zoom with all school principals. And she said, I need your help. I don't know how we're going to educate during this period, but I think it's unacceptable that we wait until this health crisis is over. Let's figure it out together. The Secretary of Education of the state of Sao Paulo did the same thing. The very same day the national government shut down the school, he reached out to the 10 most influential industrialists in Sao Paulo. And they were able in two weeks to build a multimedia platform that include television, that include podcasts, that include printed packages, and that converted the program of school feeding that is delivered through schools into a cash transfer program delivered through credit cards to families. And this was done in a matter of weeks as a result of partnership between those 10 industrialists as well as the partnership of a public university. So what really surprises about the pandemic it's not that during a global crisis of this magnitude, there would be so much interest. What really should surprise us is not that there would be a calamity. What should surprise us is that there would be so much interest and effort to sustain educational opportunity. And to me, the real silver lining of, of this pandemic has to be assessed not against the counterfactual of, well, what if we hadn't had a pandemic? Nobody chooses to have a pandemic. And not against the counterfactual of, well, what did we lose relative to the education system before the pandemic? Because the real story is that before the pandemic, the education system was not educating all children and it was not helping them learn what they need. The World Bank had produced estimates, um, this, which they have characterized as learning poverty that showed that at least half of the kids after spending four or five years in school couldn't basically decode what they were reading. And so to, to hold as a standard the education system before the pandemic reflects a tremendous poverty of aspirations and a tremendous poverty 
of imagination. What I think, what I think should surprise us is that in this moment of crisis, the global education movement that was created when, when education was included as a human right in the declaration adopted in 48 came to shine involving unprecedented forms of collaboration among UN agencies and non-governmental international organizations, and among them and governments, and among them and subnational governments, and among them and organizations of civil society, such as the examples I provided of the Hogar de Cristo in Chile, or the Fundación, the Foundation in Mumbai, or the Network Teach for All. That is what should surprise us. Now, as we look at those 45 innovations, what do they have in common? They were all created in a spirit of rapid prototyping. The nation of Vietnam produced in one month, engaging most of their schools in entire primary to secondary school curriculum delivered by television. Think about this for a moment. The design and delivery of an education television station is a project that usually takes three to five years. This was done in one month. A second silver lining is that during the pandemic, we all discovered that no one learns very much when they are in fear. And that if we want students to learn, we need to attend to their social emotional well-being. I think that this is a lesson that is going to remain for us. Um, it is a big learning during the pandemic. Um, we also discovered that it was possible to create multiple ways to reach marginalized children. I'm not saying they were effective. Of course, they were highly ineffective, but think about it. They were created in two weeks. They were created in four weeks. We began to, to put together to construct libraries of digital resources, and we discovered the tremendous power of collaborations, both of teachers within schools, but also of teachers across schools, and in many cases of teachers across countries. And we rediscover the power of inclusive leadership. So more recently, with colleagues in UNESCO, in the International Bureau of Education, we set out to look not at the innovations of the early months of the pandemic, which is what the first study did, the study of the 45 innovations, but of innovations that had demonstrated lasting power that are still around. And what we did was to use the recently released UNESCO report on the futures of education as a framework and to ask, was there any innovation that happened during the pandemic that is already aligned with the ideas of this report? As I imagine many of you know, UNESCO in its 77 year history has three times put together an independent commission that has produced a report on the futures of education. And this report produced by a commission chaired by the current president of Ethiopia, basically has three sections. The first section talks about the most serious challenges of our time, climate change, growing social inequality, poverty, democratic backsliding, challenges to human rights, and argues that educational systems need to be aligned with the development of the competencies that actually help us address those challenges. The second part of the report talks about what would it take to transform the culture of education. And the third piece of the report says, what are the levers to produce that? So, to transform the culture of education. The basic argument of this report is everyone is a change maker. Uh, the report is unapologetically, uh, unapologetically and intentionally aligned with human rights and argues for learning that is authentic and relevant, authentic to problems in the real world, relevant to values that matter to the students. And to transform the culture of education, the report says we need to reimagine pedagogy, curriculum, the organization of school, the teaching profession, and the larger learning ecosystem. And the report proposes four levers for change, innovation and research, universities. It gives universities much greater attention than any of the two previous reports. And it argues that universities have the possibility and the responsibility to partner with education systems to help transform the culture of education. Argues for broad and, and participatory social dialogue, democratic dialogue, and for a reimagined cooperation. Well, the interesting thing in the second study of these 31 innovations is that during the pandemic, there were innovative programs that were created that are completely aligned with these ideas and essentially uh, are innovations that support student-centered learning, much more personalization than is typically the case in normal schools. Not so many that support deeper learning that should concern us. The arrangements that were created to teach in the pandemic um, were focused on lower levels of cognitive development as opposed to more advanced levels of cognitive development. They all address social emotional well-being and what we would call the development of the whole child. There were phenomenal innovations to use digital platforms to build communities of practice and to help teachers 
um, improve their skills. And there were tons of innovations to find creative ways to engage families in education. Fernando. The third study, yes, Fernando. I need to finish. Two, two minutes. Please. Two minutes. So the third study is a study of innovation of universities during the pandemic. We looked at 120 universities around the world and we asked the question, what did universities do during the pandemic? Partnering with cool systems. And the findings of that report are extremely encouraging because we see that in this moment of crisis, many universities didn't just look in the mirror and ask, how are we gonna help our students? They ask, how are we gonna help societies? To conclude, what are the big risks? Well, the big risks, of course, are that we do nothing or even worse, that we content ourselves with returning to the education systems that we had before the pandemic, or that we internalize a, a poor set, an unambitious set of aspirations for what it would mean to build back better. The opportunity is indeed to build back better, building on the innovation dividends and on the ideas that this pandemic brought to the fourth. I apologize that I took a little longer than I intended. I'm sorry, Thank I you. rushed the, I'm happy to send you copies of the paper. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando, for your presentation.